Dreamcast server, there's an open rack upload file, and finally there's an outbound connection to a upstream HP server. So that's that's pretty much all I saw. Uh, any questions about that? Cool. So the next tool is S-Trace. Uh, how many people use S-Trace? Okay, not as many. Uh, S-Trace, again, is it's Linux only, it doesn't work on OS X, but similar to LSL, it uh, can connect to a running process. And the cool thing about these tools is they're, they're not Linux specific, or rather Ruby specific. You can run them on any process and get a bunch of information about that process. So there's two, way, two main ways to run S-Trace. Uh, first is a summary mode with the dash C option. So the way this works is you attach to a process, it runs for a while, you control C and you end up with a report that gives you a summary of what happened. So here you'll notice uh, the top two system calls. So S trace traces system calls and signals. System calls are essentially functions that are defined in the kernel. So you know you have a bunch of functions defined in your C code and your Ruby code, and anytime one of those calls into the kernel, it jumps into kernel space, and that's known as a syscall. So the two syscalls that show up at the top here are read and write. Uh, this makes a lot of sense, especially in a Rails application, you're reading in HTTP requests, writing out SQL queries, reading the results back, uh, doing a lot of reads and writes. And so most of the time in the kernel here is spent doing that. The next way to run it is in tracing mode. So tracing mode actually will show you in real time as system calls are happening inside the process. So when you run this, uh, it'll just start spitting out stuff. It goes by pretty fast, so usually I'll use the dash O option to write it to a file. Uh, so if we look at this output in a little more detail, uh, in a Rails app, again, you're likely to notice a lot of reads and writes. So here's the actual read call uh, in more detail. So you can see the first argument to read is a file descriptor that it's reading from. So file descriptor 22 in this case is an inbound HP connection. Again, if you looked at LSO, you would actually see the IP and port associated with that file descriptor. Uh, you can see the HP request that's getting read. So here it's just uh, a get. And there's much more information, the number of bytes that were read, and how long that call took. Similarly, uh, on a Rails app, you would see something like this. So here we're writing to file descriptor 5, an SQL query. And then right after that, we read the results back. And here you'll notice the read call takes about uh, 1.3 seconds. So this is uh, you know indicative of a slow query. And this is something that I'll, I'll often do is collect a bunch of S-trace data and then run a Ruby script on it, kind of look for slow system calls. So if you run S-trace on Ruby, you might notice a few things. Uh, one of the first things I noticed when I ran S-trace on a production Ruby instance was something like this a lot of SIGBT alarm signals coming in every now and then. So I, I did a little bit of uh, digging into this, and what I learned was that Ruby 1.8 uses signals to schedule its green threads. So there's a bunch of threads defined in Ruby land that are green threads, and the way that it knows to switch between those is that it tells the kernel, hey, every 10 milliseconds, send me the signal, that way, every time I get the signal, I'll know I need to go ahead and switch threads. Uh, another thing you might notice here in summary mode is a lot of calls to sig proc mass. Uh, this is actually due to a Ruby bug uh, that was recently fixed in 188. Uh, so here you'll notice three and a half million calls, 100% of the time in the kernel that's being spent in this one syscall. Uh, so what's going on here is a lot of a Linux distribution builds Ruby with the enable pthread option, and that in, uh, ends up enabling this obscure option that does a lot of sig proc mass calls every time it's switching threads and uh, rescuing exceptions, a bunch of stuff like that. And this actually ends up in a 30% overhead, so it makes your Ruby binary 30% slower, which is a pretty big sort of impact. So again, you can run this, you can run S trace on your production site right now, collect, you know, 10 or 20 seconds worth of data, hit control C, and if you see sick proc mass is spending a lot of time, uh, that tells you right away that you should probably spend some time recompiling your Ruby. Uh, use something like RVM or an RE Debian packet instead of your standard sort of Debian, Red Hat, Ubuntu, Debian, uh, Ruby. Uh, 
That is correct, yeah. The point uh, over here was it's also, this has been fixed in the very latest Debian Ubuntu Debian packages. So the next tool is TCP dump. Uh, so we talked about sort of general tracing stuff. Uh, since we are writing a lot of network aware applications, a lot of times we'll run into sort of weird network issues going on. So TCP dump can be really useful for that. Uh, what TCP dump does is basically dump traffic in real time that's going over a network. So there's a bunch of information, the man page is really helpful, but what it boils down to essentially is a, an expression that you pass into TCP dump. So here's an example of a very simple expression. We're telling it, capture all TCP data that's connecting to the destination port 80. So anything that's connecting to web server, trace all that data. And so again, you know, if you ran this on your system, you would right away start seeing all the incoming and outgoing HTTP requests. Uh, so here we can see there's an incoming request for uh, an image and you can see all the headers and all the data that's associated with that HTTP request. Similarly, you can do this for MySQL. So here's all the SQL queries that are going over the network, for instance. The best way to use a uh, TCP dump though is with the dash W option. So this, instead of printing out the packets to SD out, we'll write all the packets to a file. And this is really useful because you could run this on your production server, uh, collect a bunch of data over a couple hours, and then download that file locally and open it up in a tool called Wireshark, which is really nice and gooey for uh, filtering and interpreting and viewing this sort of data. So here again is an HTTP request, and you can see that it's a much nicer sort of gooey that you can dig into and see all the, all the details about that HTTP request. The other nice thing is that it understands a lot of uh, common protocols like HTTP, MySQL, stuff like that, and so it'll parse out the data and show it to you in a way that makes a lot more sense. So that's TCP dump. Any questions about that? All right, so let's move on. So the next tool is Perf Tools. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite tools. Uh, it's actually a set of tools that were developed at Google that they use internally for performance work. Uh, the one I'm going to talk about in particular is their CPU profiler. So again, here's some instructions for later. Basically, you download, compile, and the way this works is you can LD preload the library, and then all you have to do is set an environment variable uh, before you start your process, and that tells the process to write a profile out to whatever location you specify. And then it comes bundled with a uh, Perl script called pprof that's able to analyze your profile and give you a bunch, bunch of data. So like any sort of profiler out there, you know, it's got the standard text-based <coughs> output that shows you what's going on. But the really nice thing about Perf Tools is that they have this built-in graphical output that makes it a lot easier to understand your code and understand where time is being spent. And just by looking at this, you know, the bigger that a function shows up, the more time it's taking, the more CPU cycles it's spending. So some examples of uh, places I've used this. Um, the cool thing about Perf Tools is it's a sampling profiler, so every, every so often it'll take a sample. And what this means is it's fairly low overhead and you can actually run it in production. So I ran this in production on a pretty big Rails app for five or six hours during peak time and collected a bunch of data and then generated a graph. And what you'll notice in this graph in particular is that about 12% of production time is being spent to function RE match exit. And the cool thing again about this graphical call graph layout is you can follow that up to the functions that called it. If you follow it up a few levels, you'll notice that all of these calls are coming from a function RB stir sub bang. So like you would imagine, RB stir sub bang is the uh, C equivalent or the C implementation of the function string sub bang. And if you traced where all these calls are coming from in Rubyland, you'll find that all of this stuff is coming from time.parse. And sure enough, if you open up time.parse, you'll notice code that looks something like this. And since time.parse supports you know, a variety of time formats, the way it's implemented is that it runs a bunch of regexes until one of them succeeds, and then it figures out what the time string uh, translates to. So uh, in this case, uh, the solution for us was to switch from time.parse, switch from a Ruby-based time parser to a C-based time parser. Uh, and Jeremy Evans is actually doing a uh, talk about this later, uh, his gem called Home Run, which 
moves the date time libraries into C land instead of Ruby land. Another uh, example, I maintained the event machine gem, and for a long time there was a known issue where if you use Ruby threads and event machine together, uh, especially with equal, it was really slow. And so again, I just ran virtuals on this, and sure enough, I noticed you know, a quarter of the time is being spent in memcopy, and again, you can trace the memcopy up and see where those calls are coming from. So in this case, they're coming from uh, two functions like uh, the VM, RB thread save context and RB thread restore context. So once I knew that this was threading related and it was coming from these two functions, I was able to just sort of look at the implementation of those functions and figure out what was going on and fix the issue. Uh, in this case, the event machine was allocating a bunch of really huge network buffers on the thread stacks. And since every time threads are uh, swapped in and out, they're copied back and forth, it was doing a lot of mem copying uh, and it was causing a lot of overhead. And so we just moved these buffers onto the heap instead of the stack, and that fixed the issue. So any questions about perf tools? Uh, so I was using perf tools for a bunch of stuff, and what I realized was in a lot of these graphs, like, sure, it was cool to see that mem copy was happening, or thread safe context, or especially, you know, like RB stir something, but what I really wanted to see was the actual Ruby functions themselves. So I created this project called Perftools or RB. Uh, it's on my GitHub, and it's essentially a fork of, or a wrapper rather, around Perftools that <coughs> makes it Ruby aware. Here's how you use it. You can look at the readme, it's pretty good. Uh, so, I'm just gonna grab some water real quick. So if we take this example, um, there's a really simple Sinatra app that has two actions, right? One is slash sleep, which is, <coughs> time intensive, so it's, it takes a long time. And the other is a compute action, which is CPU intensive. So it takes a while, but it's also spinning the CPU, where it's the first one, you know, the kernel is smart enough to say, this process wants to sleep, let me just pause it. So we run this application inside Pro Tools, and we send both of these actions uh, 50 requests each. And what you end up with is something like this. <coughs> so on the left, uh, so there's actually two modes that you can run perf tools on RB in. On the right is sort of the regular CPU profiler. So like you would expect, uh, the compute action, which is very CPU intensive, shows up as the highest, as the biggest thing on the right. But you can also run it in real time mode, and so that's measuring wall time. And on that graph, the sleep action shows up at the top because it actually takes longer than the compute action. The compute action is also on that graph, but it's not as expensive in real time as the sleep action. So here's a bunch of examples of ways I've used this and found it helpful. Uh, early versions of the Redis gem use system timer on every single read and write command, and so running perf tools on that, we were able to see that that was a lot of overhead. And once we knew that that was an issue, we switched over to using native TCP timeouts on the reads and writes. <coughs> uh, another way I like using perf tools is just to sort of get a sense of the code base. Uh, since it shows you the entire call graph, you can get a sense of what functions are being called, how often they're called, and what other functions they call. And so here, for instance, you can see RubyGem spends a lot of its time in uh, file system access, so it's traversing directories, just checking if files exist, opening up gem specs, and doing a lot of file system access. Uh, recently, I ran for tools on Bundler and noticed that about 25% uh, of the time was being spent in the gem version spaceship function. Uh, it's just because Bundler is doing a lot of version comparisons to try to figure out what the optimal versions to install are based on your gem file. So, in this case, uh, once I knew that this was an issue, I was able to patch that function itself and made actually a bunch of sort of micro-optimizations to that function. Uh, but even those were those good enough to sort of give Bundler a 15% overall improvement. And again, you know, like, if you look at this patch, these, these are the sort of optimizations that are not sort of recommended to do, to make, because they are micro-optimizations. But the whole point here is that once you profile your application and you know that it's spending a lot of time on a certain function, it makes sense to spend time improving that function. 
And then finally, most recently, I added an object allocation profiler to Perkins. And so here, uh, instead of showing you CPU overhead or real-time overhead, each uh, sample represents one object that was created. So here again, this is uh, on a big Rails app. You'll notice that time.parse and date.parse are creating a lot of objects. So we noticed earlier that these functions are very CPU intensive, but it turns out they're also uh, creating a lot of objects. And again, since Ruby has a simple sort of naive Mark and Sweep garbage collector, the more objects you create, the longer you end up spending in GC. And the longer you spend in GC, while GC is happening, nothing else can happen. So it makes your application slower. The solution for us in this case, uh, in this particular application, was to switch to the MySQL driver. And uh, most of these time.parses were coming from rows that we were reading from MySQL and trying to parse the times out of. And MySQL 2 gem knows the exact format that MySQL is going to pass it, and so it just writes uh, a few lines of C code to parse that out instead of you know, propagating it up to Ruby land and having Ruby figure out what that time is. <laughs> So that's perfect. Tools. Any questions about that? All right. So perfect tools is, is a lot of fun to use. It shows you data in a really easy to sort of understand way. Uh, uh, so the next tool is sort of related. It's a wrap middleware that wraps perfect tools and makes it even easier to use, especially in the context of Rails or rack, rack application. So you can jump into all this. Uh, the way it works though, is really simple. It's just a middleware. So here, for instance, we require the gem. We insert the middleware at the beginning of our Rails application. And what it does is add a bunch of URLs to the application that make it really easy to profile. So the simplest way to use this is the last command on the screen. And the way that works is on any URL, you can just pass in profile equals true and times equals a number. So here, for instance, it's going to run it's going to make 10 requests to the home page, and then instead of returning the contents of the home page to your browser, it'll just return the actual GIF that's the profile. So all these uh, screenshots that they, you've been seeing have been taken from these GIF sort of outputs, and that will show up in your browser right away. The other way to run it is sort of more manual, where you can start the profiler, hit a bunch of URLs, stop it, and then grab the data out. So, uh, that's pretty much it for perf tools. Any questions about that? Cool. So the next tool is Ltrace. Uh, we talked about strace earlier. Ltrace is very similar, but instead of tracing system calls, uh, calls inside the kernel, it's able to trace calls in user land to C functions in shared libraries or inside your binary. So it's similar to how strace works. You can run it in two different modes. The first one is in summary mode. So this is the same example from earlier. We have you know these threading issues with the RAM machine. And sure enough, just like perf tools, it shows you that a lot of time is being spent in mem copy. <coughs> and the next way to run it is in tracing mode. So uh, the cool thing here again is you can see stuff as it's happening in real time. So we talked about earlier, you know, Ruby uses SIGBT alarms to tell it to switch threads. And here you can actually see the SIGBT alarm comes in, and then sure enough, it does two mem copies, one to copy the current thread out, another to copy the new thread in. And what you'll notice again here is that the last argument to mem copy, which represents the number of bytes that you want mem copy to in out, uh, in this case is fairly large. And so every time it had to do a thread context switch, it would end up copying one megabyte in and one megabyte out, which was the reason it was so slow. So that's, that's Ltrace. Um, one of the problems with Ltrace itself is that it's unable to trace calls being made to shared libraries. And since all Ruby extensions, uh, Ruby C extensions, are shared libraries that are loaded in during runtime, uh, Ltrace can't show you what's going on inside those library calls. And so Joe DiMato forked uh, Ltrace and added support for libdl. It's up on his GitHub. He actually just recently took over maintainership of Ltrace, so the next version of Ltrace will contain all these patches. So these, these patches add a bunch of options, uh, but basically the way this works is you can use the dash x option to trace any C function. 
So here, for instance, we're tracing all calls to garbage collect. Garbage collect is a function defined inside the VM that does garbage collection. And sure enough, in tracing mode, in real time, you can see garbage collection as it's happening. Uh, so here, you'll see that you know garbage collection is running uh, every few seconds, and every time it runs, it takes about 200 milliseconds. This is fairly typical for uh, any decently sized Ruby application in MRI. Uh, and the thing to note here is, again, when garbage collection is running, nothing else can happen. And so if it takes 200 milliseconds and it gets triggered during your request, that's going to add 200 milliseconds to your response time right away. Uh, like I said, you can run this on any shared libraries, any Ruby extensions. Uh, so for instance, the MySQL client library defines a function called MySQL real query that's used to make all queries. And so on any given process, you know, you can attach to a process using its page and start tracing all the queries, make, queries it's making. And so here again, you'll notice a bunch of queries going on. The first argument is the connection pointer. So you'll notice that there's two different connections. Uh, and then one of these connections, it makes a really slow query on that ends up taking 1.2 seconds. And uh, you can do this on any other function. So for memcache, for instance, uh, I use this to track down weird cache expiration issues just by collecting a bunch of sets and gets over time and then analyzing them in the Ruby script after that. So that's Ltrace. Any questions about that? Cool. So the next tool is GDB. GDB is sort of the standard debugger uh, that's part of the GNU suite. Uh, this is really useful in Ruby land for tracking down site faults. So uh, I'm sure some of you guys have at least seen uh, the sort of output at the top where Ruby will suddenly die and all it says is site fault. So to sort of demonstrate this, uh, I have a simple C extension at the bottom. And all it's doing is defining a global function called segv. Uh, that just does invalid memory access and causes a cycle. So we have a simple piece of Ruby code that requires this library and then causes a cycle. And before doing, causing the cycle, it does a couple things. So it'll, it calls you know, four dot times, and then dir ch dir, hash new, and then it cycles. So there's two ways of using GDB. One is to attach to a running process. So again, we find the process, we take its PID, we pass that to GDB, connect to that process, and then uh, it lands in a prompt, so you type continue, that basically says, you know, continue running this process until something happens, and then sooner or later it's going to say fault, and you'll be back in that prompt, and you can start collecting more data. The other way to run it is using a core dump. Uh, a core dump is essentially a dump of the contents of memory. To do, to do it this way, you have to do a couple things before, beforehand. Uh, so the first thing you have to do is bump up the core limit size. Uh, so here, we're basically setting it up to 300 megs. So what this means is as long as the process is under 300 megs, it'll get dumped out when it dies. Uh, and the other thing we do is create a directory for the cores to live in, and then tell the kernel to put the cores into that directory. And once you end up with the core dump, instead of uh, invoking GDB with the process ID, you just pass in the core dump, and then it's smart to figure out what you do. So once you're at the GDB prompt, uh, the simplest command to use is where. And what that does is basically give you a stack trace of all the C functions that were called uh, when that site fault happened. And once you have this, you can basically you know, copy and paste this, go to GitHub, open an issue, and let the maintainer know this is what was going on. And at least they'll have a bunch of information to try to figure out what's causing that site fault and try to reproduce it. You could also just start looking at the code itself. You know, you have enough information about here. Uh, you have the function names, the files, and the line numbers that they're defined on. And if you look at this in more detail, uh, you'll notice you know the very first frame is main. Main is sort of the entry point to any C function that calls Ruby run gets Ruby up and running. Uh, you'll notice the numeric dot C. It's invoking function int do times. So that's the four dot times that we were calling. That calls Ruby yield, which is yielding to the block. There's a dir.c, there's a hash.c. So you can see how the C code sort of relates to the Ruby code that was causing the cycle. Uh, similar to the whole perf tools thing, I was using GB for a while. And again, what I really wanted was Ruby level information, so the C level information. So I created this project called ggb.rb, uh, which is sort of a GDB, a scripted GDB with hooks for Ruby such that it knows what's going on inside the Ruby 
So again, this is on my GitHub. Uh, the way this works is it adds a bunch of Ruby commands. So for instance, there's an eval command. And so you can attach to any running Ruby process and start evaluating code inside the context of that process. This is really useful for debugging. It's useful for injecting code. For instance, so if you wanted to start profiling an application, you could attach a GDB and run Ruby eval to require per tools and get per tools running inside that process. Uh, there's a bunch of other commands. So there are commands to inspect all the threads. Here uh, is a list of all the threads. You can see the first thread is the main thread that's waiting on joining the second thread. The second thread is in a sleep 60 uh, that has 57 more seconds left. The third thread is waiting on file descriptor 5. Again, you can look at LSO to see what that file descriptor points to. And the last thread is the current running thread. There's some commands to inspect the heap. So you can see how many objects are alive, what types of objects are alive. You can inspect the contents of objects themselves. So here we're grouping all objects by content, or all strings by content, rather. So if we take that example from earlier, where you know we're causing the segfault, now with gdb.rb, we can get Ruby-level information about what's going on. Uh, so we type Ruby threads, and instead of you know C functions, C file names, we get the Ruby functions, Ruby file names, and Ruby line numbers. So a couple ways that I've used this and found it really helpful are versions of we got a question. Ruby okay. version agnostic. So uh, the question was about what Ruby versions it, it supports. I just pushed a version last week that supports NE 1.8, so it'll work on 1.8.6, 1.8.7, RE, or MRI. But not 1.9. Not 1.9 yet. Yeah. Okay. And uh, another thing to note is that it only works on Linux because GB7 currently does not support OS X. So here's an example. Uh, there was a there was a plugin called Rails Warden, that's an authentication plugin for Rails, and it was causing memory leak, and sure enough, you can attach, here's a list of all objects by class name, and there were, we noticed that there were several thousand instances of each of the middlewares, and what was going on was basically, uh, Warden was leaking its, its middleware by adding itself to a global array, and since middleware always points to the next middleware in the chain, it ended up leaking the entire chain of middleware. <coughs> Uh, you'll notice a lot of interesting things if you just sort of poke around in applications. Uh, Mongrel, for instance, has this line of code that I discovered that just creates a new thread that just does <laughs> sleep one in a loop. Uh, God had a lot of memory leaks for a long time, and again, you can run some of these commands. And we noticed that there were way more instances of God watch than we expected, and there were a bunch of arrays that had <coughs> over 90,000 elements. So these were arrays that were just growing infinitely without ever getting purged. So that's JVRB. Uh, uh, the next two is memprof. So memprof is sort of a memory profiler for Ruby. Uh, it's similar to Bleak House, if you guys have ever used that, but it doesn't require any patches to the VM, so it's just a gem that you can just require and start using. Uh, so memprof has a bunch of features, a bunch of API. You can look at the readme for more information. Uh, for instance, you can track objects created during a block. So for instance here, we're creating you know, 100 strings, 100 floats, 100 modules, and it'll just print out a simple report that shows you how many objects were created or how, what lines. There is memprof.dump that shows you a bunch of details about objects. Instead of just giving you a summary, it shows you in JSON the actual structure and details about the objects. So here, for instance, is a string. You can see how long it is what its data is, what class it is, et cetera. You can do this for any of the native types. Uh, arrays, for instance, you'll notice, uh, show you the actual contents of the array. Hashes will show you uh, key value pairs and whether or not there's a default proc. And then classes, uh, like you'd expect, also have a superclass. Uh, there's an instance variable table that, has, that actually holds both class variables, instance variables, and constants. And there's a method table that holds all the methods that are defined. Um, mem memprof dump all is basically just dump, but it gets called on every single object that's defined. And since this all gets dumped out as JSON, it's really sort of easy to run analysis scripts on it after the fact and uh, get more information out of the data. So one of the one of the ways to do this is using 
mprop.com, which is sort of a web-based UI that can take one of these JSON dumps and create uh, sort of a clickable interface for understanding what's going on. So here's a really quick example. I think I'm running out of time, but I'm going to speed through this. Uh, using mprop.com to find a leak in Rails 3. So early version of Rails 3 had this really massive memory leak in dev mode. So the way uh, I'm going to sort of walk through how I found and fix this leak. So you require memprop. Uh, we send the application 30 requests, and we run memprop on the PID to sort of dump out the feed, upload it, and give you a URL so you end up on a page like this. Uh, you can start clicking around to sort of get a sense of what's going on. Here I'm going to click on duplicate classes by name. Uh, so you see something like this, you know, there's 2,500 classes and there's 30 copies of test controller. So this is all built on MongoDB and you can see the MongoDB query that's being used. So, you know, we say find the all classes but limit it by the ones that are named test controller. So you get a list of all of those. We click on one of those to get details about it. And um, the cool thing about this is you can see the references, right? So the whole point with the GC is that as long as something is being referenced, garbage collection is going to think that it's in use and it's not going to get rid of it. And so you can use Memprop to find what's still referencing an object. So here we see one of the references to test controller is a hash uh, that has exactly 30 elements, which is interesting because we sent exactly 30 requests to this application. So we click on that, and sure enough, we see that this hash is holding references to all those test controllers. And the cool thing is that it shows you the file and line numbers. You can jump to that code and figure out what's going on. So in this case, uh, it's basically a bunch of caching logic inside Rails that was uh, sort of conflicting with dev mode. And the fix for this was really simple. Uh, instead of using the actual class object as the hash key, we just used the string test controller as the hash key. And so every time in dev mode, a new version of test controller gets loaded in, it still has the same string key that gets mapped into this hash, so it just overwrites the old entry instead of creating a new entry. There's a couple more MetPro features that we're working on, uh, sort of middleware that is a tracing framework. So for each request, it collects a bunch of data about how long the request took, you know, a couple details about the request itself, and a bunch of information that's sort of useful just for profiling in general. So here we're collecting how many MySQL queries happened, how long they took, how many calls to GC. This was a really expensive action. You know, there were eight calls to GC that took almost two seconds to execute. And then a bunch of information about objects that were created. So here, almost four million objects, and then sort of a breakdown about all the objects by type. So this is something that I'm actually working on. The cool thing is, if you run this, uh, MapProf is mostly written in C and assembly, and so it's a really low overhead. And if you run this in production, collect data about a bunch of requests over time, you can then take all that JSON data and start analyzing it. And so I'm currently working on sort of a, a report that's generated using all this data. Uh, and this is something that I ran recently uh, on a production application and noticed that, you know, a lot of time, almost 40% of the time being spent in this application was in GC. And every time GC happened, it would take almost half a second. So that's pretty much it. Uh, the point of the stop was, you know, that there's, there's times and bugs that we all run into that sort of makes things, you know, WTF, it doesn't make any sense. And if you have the tools to start debugging and start gathering even the tiniest amount of data, you can start making progress because you'll find, you'll get some data, you'll start looking at it, start making correlations, and once you have that data, you can start investigating. If you, even if you have, you know, a line number, you can start looking at that line and start making progress instead of being stuck. And so the whole point was that, of this talk was to introduce a bunch of these tools such that when you run into issues like this in the future, at least you'll have in the back of your mind, you know, I sort of remember there was this one tool that might be able to help. And you can look at these slides and <coughs> copy some of these commands and start to use these things. Uh, there's a bunch of slides in here that I don't have time for. This is sort of a case study of uh, me running all these tools on an application and finding a bunch of problems and fixing them. Uh, like I said, all these slides are online. So be sure to check them out. And if you have any questions, you can ask them now. You can find me later on, or you can reach me on Twitter. That's it.